Hello everyone, Golden Nova here. Today's video is brought to you by one of this month's illustrious Quasar Commanders, and not a moment too soon. Terminal World just wrapped up its new card releases, and while today's subject isn't among those archetypes, the story wouldn't be the same without them. Premiering in the November 2014 core set, The New Challengers, Clifford hit the scene as the game's first big pendulum archetype. While future themes would try and emphasize its usefulness in the realms of Fusion, Synchro, and Xyz, Cleese would begin exploring this new mechanic by bolstering one of the game's less celebrated summoning methods, the Tribute Summon, with payoffs ranging from gigantic multi-attackers to a monster that was so difficult to out, it would become how we talk about unaffected monsters to this very day. So let's boot up the Master Duel Terminal system and review the story of these colossal cruisers, execute their program files to see how their systems operate, then find some plug-ins to increase their output. It's time to tower over the competition with Cliffort Explained. Today's episode is brought to you by my lovely patrons, as well as the wonderful people over at Dragon Shield. Get the sleeves as strong as dragon scales and save 5% on your order by using coupon code GOLDENNOVA at checkout. So what's the deal with Cliffords? Well, their machines were the stewards of the Tree of Life, an artifact that makes up the core of the Naturia Sacred Tree. That's right, it's lore time, kiddos! Don't worry, we've got chapters below if that's not your thing. The Tree of Life is the planet's reincarnation engine. When you die, your soul gets directed into the bottom half, the Cliffoth, where it gets purified before moving up to the top half, the Sephiroth, for the soul to be reintroduced into the world. The twin goddesses, Sophia and Tiara, were supposed to each be the administrator of their particular half. Sophia for the creating Sephiroth, and Tiara for the destroying Cliffoth. But oops! Looks like Sophia and Tiara had themselves a widow god war, and Sophia won out taking control of both halves and sealed Tira into the Cliffoth, splitting her soul into ten distinct cores and used the Sephiroth system to distribute those cores into the world so that they could never be introduced to Tira, keeping her sealed away forever. Hilariously, all of those cores would just end up in the Gem Knight tribe, but that's a horrifying coincidence that we'll cover later. And then, Sophia ate dirt. After attempting to wipe out all life on the planet at the end of Age 2.0, Tierra, who still had some level of consciousness, began messing with the now unattended Tree of Life. With nothing to stop her, she began withholding the souls of creatures from the Sephiroth system, keeping them hostage in the Cliffoth. This would cause the Sephiroth to introduce soulless husks into the world as macabre reflections of their originals, husks that Tierra could manipulate using their original souls, like puppets on strings. This phenomena eventually manifested as a kind of curse that would spread and capture other creatures, transforming them against their will into similarly soulless puppets, yearning for the release of their progenitor much in the same way the Evil Swarm had done long, long ago. Fast forward a bit, and the Shadal succeeded in breaking a barrier keeping the Naturia Sacred Tree safe, causing the Tree of Life artifact that slept within to activate. It rose from the ground, revealing the Cliffoth system underneath, which awakened that system's guardians, the Cliffords. Contrary to popular belief, the Klees, at this point in the story, are actually on the good guy's side. Or I guess it would be more accurate to say they're completely ambivalent to the good guys. Seeing the Shadals as an imbalance in the system of life and death, a system they were made to protect, they wrecked the Shadals, bringing them to the brink of defeat. They were even able to bind El Shadal Construct to Apocalypse 4 Towers using the sealing power of the Ice Barrier Dragons held by Shurit, effectively cutting the Shadals from their general. The only reason things went sour was when the Klees kidnapped El Shadal Winda in an attempt to understand how this all came to pass. But it turns out that Winda actually carried a fragment of Sophia's power within them, having died from being in the mere presence of the goddess's revival when they awakened. Not only did this act as a kind of passcode, letting Tierra access the dormant Infernoids to help execute her will, this also turned the Cliffworts against our heroes, because now they saw a new aberration the power of God in the hands of mortals. And so, the Infernoids, powered by the vacuum tubes that the Clifforts had been capturing Shadals in, joined forces with the mechanical shells to wipe out the surface dwellers in anticipation for the rise of Tierra. But the story is only half of it. What the Clifforts are based on is also pretty cool. If the terms Cliffoth or Sephiroth or even the Tree of Life sounds familiar, it's because you've either been taught about that as part of your religious studies, or you've heard the term bandied about in some anime or RPG or something. 
All of these come from the Kabbalah, a Jewish text which, among many other things, outlines the Tree of Life, a diagram that outlines the aspects of God, or Sephiroth, as well as the opposite Tree of Death, made up of the opposites of those Sephiroth, the Clithoth. We'd actually see this happen again when the Zephra show up, each one representing an aspect of the Sephiroth, so it's a pretty cool parallel. The artifact itself is actually shaped like a conjoining of the two trees, it's pretty sick. And it goes even deeper than that, because each of the Klees are named after a particular kind of computer term, to really drive home the fact that this all takes place in a dual terminal cabinet. I do not know how much more blatant these have to be for you people to get this. <clears throat> As for the mechanics, they're all Earth Machine monsters, the majority of which are pendulums with a scale of either 1 or 9, and come with some pretty interesting parallels. First, all the pendulum monsters share an effect that prevents you from special summoning monsters, except Cleves, an effect that cannot be negated. Later pendulum themes would specify you could only pendulum summon their on theme cards, but Cleves are much more strict. You're either pendulum summoning them, or you're normal summoning, there is no in-between. The effect pendulum monsters also have a pendulum effect that either increases all of your clean monsters attack by 300 or debuffs all of your opponent's attack by 300. But wait, there's more. The effect pendulum monsters also have an effect where, despite their large levels, they can be normal summoned without tribute. And if you do so, or if they're special summoned, their levels become 4 and their original attacks become 1800. They're also unaffected by the activated effects of monsters whose original level or rank is lower than their current level if they've been normal summoned, making them very resilient to hand traps and other smaller monsters. And a lot of them come with that 2400 or 2800 attack and 1000 defense stat line, so just pretend I'm doing that ooh monarch stat bit whenever those show up. But before we can talk about those effect monsters, we have to talk about our normal monsters or arguably even more powerful than our effect ones. Cliffort Scout is a level 5 pendulum monster with 1000 attack, 2800 defense, and a scale of 9. This monster represents the Gyrian, the Cliffoth that conceals spiritual beauty. Its pendulum effect lets you pay 800 life points once per turn to add a Klee card from your deck to your hand. Talk about your one card scales. Scout handles it all by itself for just a measly tenth of your life points, as well as any other on theme card you could ask for. One of the strengths of this card lies in the fact that the search is a soft once per turn. So whether you bounce it back to your hand or used Wavering Eyes to cycle into another copy, you're going to be able to filter through your deck for just the right card to mobilize your infantry. And just look at that flavor text. I'm sure opening up the unknown executable file will be just what the doctor ordered, upside down smiley face. Cliffort Monolith is a level 5 normal pendulum monster with 2400 attack and 1000 defense and a scale of 1. This monster represents Gamaliel, the cliffoth of obscene acts of creation that do not enrich the spirit. Its pendulum effect activates once per turn during the end phase if you tribute summoned this turn, drawing you cards equal to the number of clean monsters you tributed for tribute summons this turn. So if Scout is here to get you off the ground, Monolith is here to give you the gas to keep on going. While pendulum summoning does let us recoup the costs for our tribute summons fairly easily anyway, it wouldn't hurt to have a couple of spare draws every turn to give us that extra push we need to close things out. And I mean, talk about your Xeno references, y'all are talking about how World Legacy is on that grind, but Dual Terminal literally has the Zohar. Next up, we have a pair of Cliff Forts that fill a similar niche. Cliffort Helix and Cliffort Carrier are both level 6 pendulum monsters with 2400 attack and 1000 defense. Helix's pendulum effect debuffs our opponent's monsters by 300, and if tributed, can target a spell or trap card on the field and destroy it. It also represents Samael, the Cliff Auth of lies and deceit. Parallel to that, Cliffort Carrier's pendulum effect boosts all of our clean monsters attack by 300, and if tributed, you can target a monster on the field and return it to the hand. This monster represents Garab, the Cliffoth of creation without the guiding hand of reason and moderation. These two can be thought of as the fodder Cliffords, as they make for the best tribute material for further clean monsters, who actually have on summon effects you can benefit from. It also means you can use them to chain block those effects, which can be valuable against hard negation like counter traps. And because having a complete scale means you could pendulum summon these over and over again, you'd have your fill of removal tricks at your disposal at all times, and meant you could run powerful cards like enemy controller that requires tributes to play, because that benefits from tributing a helix or carrier. You could say this new twist on tribute summoning really carried the archetype. Huh? Cliffort Disc is a level 7 pendulum monster with 2800 attack, 1000 defense, and a scale of 1. 
Its pendulum effect boosts our Klee attacks by 300 and represents Ga Ogshav Law, the Cliffoth of love untempered by respect, smothering the object of those affections. Which is appropriate, because when Disk is tribute summoned using any number of Klee monsters, you can special summon two Klee monsters from your deck, but are destroyed during the end phase, flooding the field with monsters before their self-destructive tendencies take hold. This can be used in a variety of ways, either by putting up a huge attack force to push for game, crush an opposing monster lineup, or get you tribute fodder for some big monsters we'll be covering later on. It's a wildly powerful card, and thank goodness they were able to fit that on one disc. Can you imagine if you had to resolve this across four of these? Cliffort Cephalopod is a level 7 pendulum monster with 2800 attack, 1000 defense, and a scale of 9. This card's pendulum effect debuffs our opponent's monsters by 300 attack, and represents Golahob, Cliffoth of Law without mercy or compassion. When this monster is tribute summoned using any number of clean monsters, you can activate an effect that, if your opponent has more monsters in their grave than you do, they lose life points equal to the difference times 300, and you gain the same amount of life points as damage they took. So if your opponent has 10 monsters in their grave and you have zero, get ready to transfer 3,000 delicious life points from their account to yours. This is meant to play off one of Pendulum's primary mechanics, where all of your monsters will go to your face-up extra deck, while your opponents will presumably go to their grave. And while such huge chunks of damage can win you a game, it otherwise doesn't do anything to advance your game state. So, suffice it to say, it didn't really see much play. And that design is not helping. It's not bad, per se, it's actually really well put together, but it's very... I don't know, something about the Klee's being very mechanical up till this point, only for it to suddenly shift to a giant, fleshy tentacle is very off-putting. It's like PG-13 HR Geeker over here. Cliffort Shell is a level 8 Pendulum monster with 2800 attack, 1000 defense, and a scale of 9. Its Pendulum effect debuffs our opponent's monsters by 300, and represents Satoriel, the Cliffoth of forms that obscure the nature within. And if normal summoned by tributing any number of clean monsters, it can attack twice during each battle phase, and deals piercing battle damage. A fairly straightforward Klee, able to dole out considerable damage all by itself, playing very well with our attack boosting effects. Not really a lot to say here, though I will say I personally will never forget this card, because it's responsible for winning me a game I never should have won. Not because I was playing Klee's, mind you, but it was during that weird format where Snatch Deal was legal, so I took a fully powered shell and hit twice for game. It was very funny. That being said, Konami, never bring back Snatch Deal. Cliffort Stealth is a level 8 Pendulum monster with 2800 attack, 1000 defense, and a scale of 1. It boosts all of our Klee's attacks by 300, and represents Gogiel, the Cliffoth that opposes creative force, seeking to halt it in its tracks. This is another flavor win, because when Tribute summoned using any number of clean monsters, you can target a card on the field and return it to the hand, but your opponent can't activate cards or effects in response to this effect's activation. It literally stops your opponent from interacting with it and actively undoes their autonomy. It's pretty cool. Where Carrier and Helix would usually do the chain blocking, Stealth is actually much better thanks to that spell speed 4 clause, so nothing short of negating the summon itself is going to stop this. Which makes sense. When you're up against a giant fleet of death machines, they won't see this invisible one coming. That covers our Pendulum monsters, but we're not done yet. Now it's time for the heavy hitters. Apocalyphort Skybase is a level 9 monster with 2900 attack and 2500 defense, and represents Thaumiel, the essence of antagonistic forces, existing only to oppose something else. Skybase can't be special summoned, and must be normal summoned by tributing three clean monsters. If normal summoned, it's unaffected by activated monster effects from ones with a lower level or rank than it, which is pretty standard up to this point, but is also unaffected by spells and traps, making it immune to almost anything in the game except for only the highest level or ranked monsters, and now links. And once per turn, you can target a monster your opponent controls and take control of it until the end phase. No strings attached, no restrictions, you just get to use their best monster for a whole turn. Ain't that something? But because our scales limit us to only special summoning clean monsters, we're not going to be able to do the best thing we can do with temporarily stolen monsters. That being, sending it away for some kind of other summon. Unless it's a machine, but we'll get to that later. It's a pretty good effect, but it didn't really catch on. Sadly, you can be unaffected by just about any card effect, but if your monster folds in battle to a blue-eyes white dragon, sinking three monsters into it is a terrible value proposition just waiting to happen, meaning this enormous enigma is anything but based. 
Apocalyphort Towers is a level 10 monster with 3000 attack and 2600 defense that represents Nehemoth, the cliff off that itself represents the culmination of all the negative forces that came before, a monument to the opposition of God. Towers has the same summoning conditions, restrictions, and protections as Skybase, though because of the increased level, also protects against level and rank 9 monsters, crucial for that generator matchup. While on the field, all special summoned monsters lose 500 attack and defense, and once per turn, you can make your opponent send a monster from their hand or side of the field to the graveyard, their choice. Now, I'm not normally a big proponent of giving our opponent choices, because they're just going to pick the ones that benefit them the most. But this effect doesn't send monsters to graveyard, it makes your opponent send a monster to the graveyard. Not only will this bypass any effect activations that require the monster to be sent to graveyard by a card effect, this also bypasses protections that make monsters unaffected by card effects. Because once again, you're not using a card effect to get rid of it. Because your opponent gets to choose, they likely won't do that right off the bat, but eventually they'll run out of monsters to send in its place and won't have much of a choice. The debuff also comes in pretty handy, because while it's only 100 attack more than Skybase, a monster now needs to have 3500 or more attack to actually contest towers. And that's what made this card so formidable, as back when it came out, there wasn't really an easy answer to this. Kaijus would eventually become the go-to answer for monsters like this, and Power Creep would start putting monsters big enough to deal with this in the extra deck for everyone to use. But at its peak, this was a terror to behold, an almost unanswerable threat that stood tall over the opponents, watching them squirm, looking for an answer, only to find their quest for salvation to be a fruitless one. And that's why, to this day, when we get a monster that's unaffected by almost everything, or we give an effect that makes it so, that's why we call it a Towers. Lastly, we have a Link monster, because Master Rule 4 really put a wet blanket on the whole pendulum mechanic, and a lot was riding on a new wave of archetypal Link monsters to help solve that. And one of them was Cliffort Genius, a Link 2 monster with 1800 attack, requiring any two machine monsters as material. This Link Summoned card is unaffected by spell and trap effects, as well as the activated effects of other Link monsters, which is a nifty twist on the established formula that keeps it in line with the Apocliforts. Once per turn, you can target a face-up card on each player's field, except this card, and both those cards have their effects negated until the end of this turn. And when two monsters are special summoned at the same time to the zones this card points to, you can add a level 5 or higher machine monster from your deck to your hand. This is pretty brilliant and sees play in a lot more than just Cleese. Any machine deck, especially Earth Machine decks, that can trigger this is going to have some great negation in the extra and a potential search when utilizing cards like Earth and Schedule. But for our purposes, this card is even better. Not only does Pendulum Summoning to its zones give us more clean monsters, maybe even a Towers now that you have three material for it, the negation actually works to our advantage. See, when normal summoning a clean monster without tributing, the effect that treats it as a level 4 monster with reduced stats isn't an applied one like Yang Zing's additional effects, it's a continuous one, meaning you can negate that debuff, returning them to their original stat line and level. And due to the way it's worded, even when the negation wears off, you still get to keep the base stats, meaning you've got a free monarch-sized monster. It's a pretty smart way to incorporate these kinds of effects that's both useful and flavorful, and I hate that I have to give that kind of praise to a fragment of Tierra of all things. Alright, that's all the monsters, now it's time for our spells and traps, and we're leading things off with something nasty. Sacrifice is an equipped spell card that can only be equipped to a clean monster. It gains 300 attack and can't be destroyed by battle. The equipped monster can also be treated as two tributes for the tribute summon of a clean monster, and if this card is sent from the field to the graveyard, you can add a clean monster from your deck to your hand. This is a premium search off of Scout during the early game. Letting any individual Klee act as two tributes for your big ones at a point in the game where your resource engine isn't online. And it even gives you more searches. And if you aren't able to tribute summon, it makes the monster a bit of an anchor to keep your board safe, making it more buff and immune to battle destruction. And the benefits don't stop there. It also gives you the opportunity for maximum orb pondering. Laser Clip is a field spell card, and during your main phase, you can normal summon a clean monster in addition to your normal summoner set. And the normal summon of clean monsters can't be negated. 
This card wasn't played very much, largely because when you had a theme that was meant to churn out three or four monsters a turn via Pendulum Summoning, an extra normal summon seems pretty passe, so why would you run the brick? Though nowadays, I'd actually highly recommend it. After all, Pendulum Summoning ain't as lucrative as it used to be, and extra normal summons can really help you get to your Link monster before you commit to the Pendulum Summon. But after all of this time, the one thing that still baffles me is the name. You'll notice that all of them are basically puns, but what the heck is Laser Clip supposed to be? Laser Ship? That doesn't make any sense, you can't make a ship out of lasers. Laser Clip? Like, an actual clip of a laser? I, I just... I, I don't get it. Look, I know I make some pretty bad jokes, but this is nigh on incomprehensible. Clive's End is a normal trap card that special summons this card on activation as an effect monster, specifically as a level 4 earth machine monster with 1800 attack and 1000 defense, and is not treated as a trap card. During the turn this card was summoned, Klee spell and trap cards you control cannot be destroyed by card effects, and if summoned this way, can count as 3 tributes for the tribute summon of an apocalypse or monster. So this isn't terrible, it does counter back row destruction, and keeping your scales safe is pretty important. You even get a monster out of the whole thing. You can use it as a single tribute, give it sacrifice to act as two, or go whole hog and put it towers over it. The main problem, as we've seen over many episodes of this series, is that this effect is dangerously slow, and doesn't do enough to justify itself in the long run. If this was some kind of big monarch mega tribute effect that used our opponent's monsters while shutting off their ability to respond, we'd be looking at a powerful disruption tool. As it is, I mean, just look at the art. The Klees want to get as far away from this as possible, too. And that's not a good sign. Climate Change is a normal trap card that adds up to three face-up Klee pendulum monsters from your extra deck to your hand. And that's it. But, past turn one, having a card that gets you back a slurry of cards ain't too terrible. It gets you back new scales in case you have to replace your old ones, and as a way to get around the Master Rule 4 Pendulum restrictions, this works wonders. Remember, when Pendulum Summoning, it's only the monsters from the extra deck that need to go to linked zones. Your hand is fair game. Granted, it wasn't really designed for that when it came out, but it still has the opportunity to change hearts and minds so people treat the deck less coldly. You know, because of the global warming. Our imminent demise is funny. Clipper Launch is a normal trap card, and until the end of the turn this card was activated, all normal summoned and set clean monsters currently on the field gain 300 attack, are unaffected by other spell and trap effects, also their effects are negated. So remember what I was saying about how genius makes our Klee's better via negation? Launch is here to do that in spades. Granted, it only works on the normal summoner set ones, so you can't just pen for three, then go for lethal after flipping this. Still, giving them not only the negation, but a small boost and the spell and trap immunity is pretty neat, and has a bit more utility than Clife's End. It doesn't see a lot of play, but I still think it was a good idea to have this at launch. Recreate is a continuous trap card, and if a monster is normal or flip summoned and it's level 4 or lower, negate its effects until the end of the turn. And if a monster is special summoned and it's level 5 or higher, negate its effects until the end of the turn, also banish it when it leaves the field. Woo! But if there are no Klee cards on your side of the field, except this card, send this card to the graveyard. This would be Clifford's skill drain substitute for a while, as it did the job almost better than the iconic card itself. When you normal summon without tributing, those level 4 Klees would get their effects negated by this, thus returning to their original stats, effectively letting you normal summon them at full power. And while this won't work on the Klees that we pendulum summon because they'll be special summoned and not level 5 or higher, this does mean they're not going to be banished when they leave the field. This also means that the Klees we tribute summon won't be affected by this and will get full value out of them, while still impacting high leveled fusion and synchro monsters. And like, being a little macro cosmos is kind of funky. Just, you know, make sure you keep a Klee on board so it doesn't have a meltdown. Wouldn't want your local game store looking like this ominous energy creator now, would ya? Alright, that's all the Klee monsters, but what do we do with them? Well, the deck is actually pretty good at being aggressive and controlling. It's kind of mid-rangey in that regard, except without that pesky little middle part. With us usually being locked to our own archetypal cards, we don't have a load of flexibility, but we make up for it with strong in-engine tools that will help us summon a bunch of giant machines before swinging in for lethal. 
so what can we play to help them out? Well, one of the ways to broaden your extra deck options is to make sure you don't have any Klee scales that would mess you up. I mentioned Wavering Eyes as a way to clear scales earlier, and it wasn't out of the ordinary for people to use their Helix activations to destroy their own scales to open up the extra deck. And it's also a reason why Performa Pal Trample Links saw a lot of play back in the day, and could honestly do so now. At scale 4, it's still low enough to facilitate all of our Pendulum Summons. And when you do perform a Pendulum Summon, you can bounce a card in either player's Pendulum Zone back to the hand. So, by kicking your other Klee Scale back to your hand, you could do anything. And considering the popularity of Link monsters like Beyond and Exceed the Pendulum, doing what you can to gain access to them is a must. Scout is no doubt our best scale out of the theme, so finding it is key. Thankfully, we've got Summoner's Art to help with that. And it's not limited to just Scout, you can also get Monolith with it for those sick draws. We've also got a bit of a foolish burial for Pendulums in the card Pendulum Treasure. Set up a Carrier or Helix in your extra deck, and next time you Pendulum Summon, you've got yourself an extra piece of fodder to feed to your powerful Cleese. Earlier in the video, I mentioned Skill Drain in relation to Recreate, but it bears repeating here that it is bonkers in Cliffords. Unlike our on theme Floodgate, Skill Drain will actually negate our Pendulum Summoned Cliffords. And while this will shut off the actual effects of Stealth, Shell, and even Towers if it's active before Tribute Summoning our big bungler, your opponent will also be hard pressed to mount a comeback without being able to rely on monster effects on the field. And just imagine what happens when you flip this after Towers hits the board. Doing a lot of punching is the name of our game, so when it comes to closing things out, consider running Arrival Rivals. The extra normal summon during the battle phase could just be a dinky little Klee, or you could tribute into something like Shell that will give you two more attacks with piercing, or a disc which will get you three attacks. How's that for being on the beatdown? Speaking of using normal summons for big beatdowns, it's hard to look at all these cards with 2400 or 2800 attack and 1000 defense and not want to run the Monarch cards. Tenacity gives us any of our spell and trap cards, Pantheism is a draw spell, and the Prime Monarch gives you a blocker and more fodder for tributes every turn. And while most of these cards require you to either have no cards in your extra deck or keep you from summoning from it, Vestalos the Shadowfire Monarch is like a Stormforth without the downside. Run Escalation, and you can Kaiju over an opponent's monster on their turn just by trading in a stealth that's already used its effect. And this enables Shadowfire's additional effect, which is very goofy. Aether the Heavenly Monarch is also pretty good. We might not be able to get the special summon, but a quick effect tribute summon ain't half bad either. And there's nothing in Escalation that says we have to tribute summon monarchs with it. Use it to sneak in a stealth during your opponent's turn, and you not only get its effects, but also those of Helix and Carrier if you tributed them. As for a silly tech pick, Piercing the Darkness seems pretty funny. You get a little draw whenever you Pendulum Summon Scout or Monolith, and when they fight, it gives them an honest effect that makes them pretty formidable in battle. Okay, that's all the info I have on Cliffhorts, but how do they stack up against the Nova Scale? Novelty. While Performa Pals technically have the title of the first Pendulum archetype, Klees represent the first concerted effort to make one competitive, and I think they nailed it out of the park. Towers took god card levels of commitment to summon, and was not only more playable, but vastly more accessible. And you honestly didn't even have to use towers to be competitive. Sometimes it was more than enough to have a recursive pile of 1800 monsters that could be turned into tribute fodder for even bigger monsters. It really showed off what the pendulum mechanic was capable of, and set the groundwork for ages to come. It certainly didn't reinvent the wheel in that regard. After all, they very clearly take inspiration from Monarchs, but its utilization of this new mechanic earns Klee a 4 in novelty. Objectivity The power of Tower has gone down considerably over the years, to the point where any deck that can access Barone legit has an out to this just by using its removal effect. Its time of making other decks quake is long gone, but not forgotten. With the right interruptions, it still makes for a potent threat, but no matter what tricks you may have, working around the special summon restriction is going to be rough. Back in the day, this might have garnered a 3, but in today's climate, I'm giving this theme a 5 in objectivity. Versatility. This is a pretty rough one. The deck is all but built to force you into playing only its own cards, and while Genius has found its way into a number of other machine decks, a single card is hardly enough to call the theme splashable in any regard. There are cheats and workarounds you can use, but it's difficult to put Klee's in anything but a 1 in versatility. Awesomeness. 
This one is also rough, because while the deck has had an impact on how we talk about the game, and did blaze a trail for Pendulum, it's still a very linear play sequence. You set up scales, search an enabler, summon out a bunch of Klees, and attack for game. Make towers if you can, but even then it's not exactly an exciting boss to get behind. The spectacle of it can be cool sometimes, but sadly I've got to give them a 2 in this category, meaning Klees get a total of 12 on the Nova scale. And that's all I have to say about Cliffords. They're iconic, demonic, and are the platonic ideal of what a Pendulum Tribute deck should be. Just make sure to keep this info in mind in case you ever get isekai into the dual terminal world, and if you ever need to brush up on it, make sure you refer to these... Cleef Notes. But now, I want to hear what you all have to say. Are Cliffords a legion to be reckoned with, or are they only a shell of their former selves? And which one's your favorite? I may be a bit vanilla on this, but it's gotta be Scout. When I think of Klee's, I think of that one. Let me know in the comments, and if you haven't already, make sure to like the video, subscribe so you don't miss an episode, and share this video with somebody you know who loves Yu-Gi-Oh! It really does a lot to help me out. Today's episode is brought to you in part by Dragon Shield. Get this leaves as strong as dragon scales that also come with their own lore while saving 5% on your order. Just make sure to use code GOLDENNOVA at checkout. Today's episode is also brought to you by my lovely patrons, including the illustrious Quasar Commanders Frankie and Marluxia as a Girl, Nebula Navigators Third Dynasty, Ada Basilisk, Adam Zajdel, Andrew Newman, Kane Senpai, Chibi Gohan, Christopher Fuss, Clock's Work, Danny Bound, Dark Dragon X830, Eric, Aaron the World Breaker, Garland Chaos, Green Knight, Great Big Pillock, Hair Bear, Harry the Ominous Benefactor, Hydrocraft 135, Iron Zero, Iskander 711, Mana Charge, Marion James E. Picotta, Mega Combi, Millennia Asta, Molly Renata, Muziki Clark, Nathan Vig, Natiel Lee Alexander, Orozco 09096, Panther J, Rebel King Lucifer, RJ the Jank Monarch, Sammy Haim, Sir Knight JCB, Sky Buster Leo, The Wizard Moose, URTV667 and Xander Wolfensberger, Cosmic Crusaders Alpha Sly, Almento5010, A Random Pup, Ariel Kersey, Beluga Masta, Blue Gem, Borger with a Shotgun, Chaz Ghost, Corbinisms, Drakenwald, Eki Bullock, Emini, Eva Padilla, Hike Boyajian, Howling Zangetsu, Herbal D, Inblink, Jester Design, Kale the Dragon, Carp, Kivon Public, King Scarlet Yu Gi Oh! Lord Whoop De Doo, Manga Pages, Matt Simmons, Michael Shimabukuro, Mustafa Aiden, Nitromo, Psycho Reaper Gaming, Shizuki Nijimura, Sophie, apparently, Stephen Williamson, Taylor Seymour, The Legendary Raven, Tucker Ordorn, Venusian Teapot, and Zell Drekka, as well as the wonderful Starlight Explorers you see on screen now. If you'd like to help me in my journey in covering all of Yu-Gi-Oh!'s archetypes, get my videos early, be a part of these credits, and participate in monthly custom card reviews, I'd be super grateful if you'd consider checking out my Patreon in the description or joining as a YouTube member. And if you'd like to see another Earth Machine Pendulum deck, I can't recommend my video on desk bots enough. I love those little goobers. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye